when I saw the trailer for Party Boy, I just immediately thought about like, man, this would be awesome if we could work with Mocha and bring this here. So I'm so glad that this has been able to be here in Buffalo and that also our panel discussion um, from Evergreen and from Best Self is also able to be here too to provide some expertise as well. Community, and the, one of the things that really inspired me, I saw a quote by Nina Simone, and it said, it's an artist's duty, that it's an artist's duty to speak of the times in which you live in. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna do exactly what she said. I'm gonna be that artist to speak about what's happening right now in this time in my community. And that's what started the creation of Party Boy. What's going on? Everything is not about reading and shade and tea and stuff like that. That stuff is superficial. That stuff you see on the reality shows and on Instagram, that stuff is nothing because we have, we have people in our community dying every day. We have young gay black men that are committing suicide, young trans folk that are committing suicide, people that are, they feel worthless and they have no value. So I might as well do Tina because at least doing Tina, I could be in this group of individuals who, that I would feel like I belong to. You know, at the end of the day, you have to talk about real ordeals that's yes. happening. So you talking about Grindr, you talking about Jack and all these different elements, this is a part of our community. A lot of us use it. I've used it before, you know, and I'm not ashamed of it. As soon as we start opening up spaces and getting real, real with each other, mm -hmm. and stop trying to be cute and say, well, I don't do this and I don't do that, right. it's the moment our younger gay kids can come up and say, you know what, I'm going to be 100% about what I do and how I do it and how I can help myself and others. Oftentimes, our boys are exploited. And I use the term boys because um, I had an experience working at the DA's office and many times young black men were victims of sexual violence and that is a story that is not told. We don't talk about issues like this um, in a way where our young black boys can be the faces of human trafficking. I guess older demographics within the LGBT community, some of them are not aware and then especially some of our um, straight brothers and sisters are not aware. You know, when they see it, it's kind of like jaw dropping but it's happening in plain sight. And I like what you touched on to talk about being vulnerable. I mean, in our society, a lot of times we see young black boys as a, a predator. Some, some people see them as predators, and that's a part of the reality. You, when you go out and you meet a, a police officer stops you, or someone says, you know, come here, this is how you need to act, this is how you need to do these things, because they don't necessarily they see our kids, our boys, as boys. They, sometimes they just see them as men and they'll treat them as so just like you saw in um in the uh netflix special uh when they see us you know those young boys who were treated as men you saw how that played out the same thing kind of happens with this situation some of these people are in economic you know social economic hardships and you know they're being preyed upon because of their financial status is very low and so you know this is a way out in their eyes, but then they end up falling victim to something that they're unaware of. Uh, when you talk about being black and gay, or being Latino and being gay, and then going into a space where our name should be just as known as any other uh, person within the heterosexual community, and you spoke about like the Eric Gardners, but you never heard of the Jamel Moores or the Timothy Deans, and a lot of times that's because there's like a um, double-edged sword or kind of like a there's a, a hypocrisy when it comes to, okay, we're gonna fight the black fight, but if it's the black gay fight, we may not be as focused on the issue. I've interviewed and researched about over 120 people. And in, the, in most of those people, I'll say about 80% of the people said they were introduced to Crystal Meth from their boyfriend. And most of those people who said their boy, uh, they were introduced to it by their boyfriend, their boyfriend was working in sex work. And that individual was introduced to it by going to certain white enclaves where they were escorted and were introduced to it themselves because the story in the black and Latino and LGBT community, our drugs of choice have always been alcohol and marijuana. If we take out the exception of the crack era, uh, that happened in the late 80s, early 90s, but when we're talking about early millennials and uh, Gen Z demographics, they weren't really around per se during the crack epidemic. So that connection is not realistic, you know, where I'm in my mid-30s. As a child, I was still young, but I could, I could remember, but if you're talking to somebody that's maybe under 32, maybe under 29, there may not be recollection of that. Identify with the underlying that people are thinking they're having fun. 
And so you have a lot of the young, younger men in the LGBT community that thinks that, you know, we're just having fun with this party and it's, it's, it's safe and it's easy. Um, and so what happens is that fun period turns into that vulnerability where you no longer have a choice. Um, but one of the things, one of the questions that comes up to my mind is, how do you even engage a conversation with someone who um, might be more on the combative side um, to even get any kind of support or any kind of referral to any services in the community. Like, how do you even in, try to engage in that conversation? When it comes to their substance use, they've probably faced numerous stigmas and prejudices um, up to the point that led them to use substances, right? So in a lot of cases, drug use is like a coping mechanism or a way to adapt with conditions um, and systems that are um, playing out in their lives, I would say. And I think most conversations um, that are successful with folks who are especially in chaotic or problematic stage of their substance use and aren't necessarily thinking about stopping using yet, conversations um, ought to start about what can we help you with, not necessarily addressing substance use. So that it's not just about the individual that has that addiction or is using that substance, it's for the family, and it's to also educate the family and your loved ones to say, hey, this person may have um, an addiction, they don't really know it, they don't know the impact of it, however, let us help you understand it. And we under help you understand the actual pace. I had to watch this film, and there's been in places, I mean, this epidemic is really crossing past state lines. I mean, it's pre I've toured Toronto, London, Manchester, Paris, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and every LGBT community of those names I just gave you, especially DC and Baltimore and Atlanta, their black community is suffering through the crystal meth epidemic. Overseas in London, they call it chemsex, and it has crossed over from white gay men to black uh, gay men. And it has become an international phenomenon, especially within the US. And so I think just joining together the LGBT community with our heterosexual brothers and sisters being an ally and being vocal about it and being not, a, being not afraid to speak your mind and say, hey, this was happening in my community. That's what and we see that they're gay or they, they're drag or they're a trans person or they're too, too feminine or you feel like they're a queen and you, don't, you despise people who are queenish, you know, you walk by and not say nothing. But well, what's wrong with that person? That person's a human just like us. They have thoughts, they have feelings, they have emotions. So we have to check that among our own self within the black gay community. Because that's exactly why, when it comes to media, that's why all of our media and ideas are being taken. You notice how so much, where everybody's assistant, where everybody's assistant. Oh, come shop with me, do my hair, be my assistant, be my choreographer, be my interior designer. But they, but some people never want us to be the star. You know? We need to break out of that kind of mentality. It's up to us, and I really challenge you guys today. When you start seeing other beautiful black trans folk, or uh, beautiful brown trans folk, or, or queer, whether they butch, whether they masculine, whether they lesbian, whether whether they were whatever, if you see them and you don't know them, stop and say hello. Hey, how you doing, brother, sister? What's going on? How you feeling? My name is this. Nothing's wrong with doing that. How can folks reach you? Um, how can folks know more about you, what you do, where you are, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. Yeah. So, and um, you can reach me if you guys go to your Instagram. I'm a big Instagrammer, so if you go to Party Boy, that's boy with an I. Is it on there? Is it up there? Okay. And that, the way that's spelled for Party Boy, uh, if you go to Party Boy Documentary on Instagram and press follow, you'll see all the updates. Um, if you go on Instagram and do Michael underscore Rice on Instagram and Facebook, um, it'll all pop up.